Hi, everyone. How are you? Okay, so raise your, was that anyone's first time watching the finale? Okay, are you guys okay? Is everyone all right? That is some tough, tough stuff. Um, my name is Jarrett Weiss, and I'm so excited to be here. The, guys, listen, if you have seen one episode, if you've seen all the, this is literally the best show on television right now. I mean, it's, it's great, like the, like the storytelling is amazing, and the acting on this show, I mean, I will literally talk about it for 45 minutes because that's what we're here to do. So guys, please welcome Yvonne Strahovski. Yvonne. Hi. How are you? I'm good. Excellent. Congratulations on the show. Thanks. You are a tough lady, Evil. I'll tell you. No. Um, I, but I mean, I, I have to know, I mean, when you, were you familiar with the source material before the script even came to you or was that sort of your no. entry into the world? No, I, I, I read the pilot and then I read for the role and then I read two and three and then I read the book. Then I realized it was a book. No, that's a joke. I, <laughs> I, I knew it was a book. I just didn't know about Margaret Atwood or The Handmaid's Tale at all before that. I mean, what, when you get this pilot script and you see this world that is so clearly painted in just the first episode, I mean, as an actor, what goes through your mind? As I see the world, what, sorry? As you read the pilot script for this and sort of figure out what the opportunity is. Like, what goes through your mind? Is it just like, well, I'm going to do everything I can to play this character? Um, well, it was it was a guessing game for me to piece together Serena Joy because I, I'm, I don't know how many people have seen the pilot, but there's not a whole lot of information in the pilot about Serena. So I really had to imagine what uh, what her backstory might be. And I just... I just guessed my own situation, my own story when I went in for it. And um, I didn't actually realize how um, complex she would be. It was really, as I went on in the process, I realized, oh shit, this is, um, this is a lot. <laughs> and she's a bitch. <laughs> okay, but I mean, yeah, obviously. But I have such a strong sense of empathy for her. Like she's living in this prison, literal prison of her own making in so many ways as you see in this episode. I mean, she really helped construct the world that now confines women. I mean, that is shocking. I mean, right. when you were thinking about her backstory as you're talking about, I mean, what were sort of the things that you clung to in building this character? The first thing that stood out to me was her Pain. And uh, the first thing that struck me in reading the pilot was that he, that the commander had done something to her prior, that whether it was the cheating uh, with the previous handmaid or s there was some trauma in their relationship to begin with. And that sort of set the ball rolling for me. And it was important for me to stay away from the movie, you know, that was done um, and any sort of anything like now we can look at the whole show or we can look at the whole book and, and say, oh, it's about feminism, it's about human rights, it's about all this, all this kind of stuff. It's really, it was important for me to get away from all of those labels to uh, just get to the core of what I thought Serena was about. And it's such a wonderful opportunity in this show to really flesh her out beyond the book because I don't know how many people have read the book, but she's, um, she's much, she's older, first of all, in the book. She is arthritic, she has a cane, and she's kind of purely just the vil villain. You don't really get that backstory. You don't get to go like in episode six where we see Serena's backstory and all of that stuff. So I had a real opportunity to try to humanize this evil person, which proved to be probably my most challenging thing with this whole role. But, um, <laughs> cause she's, God, she's a bitch. But anyway. Um, <laughs> I mean, when you, when you are starting on a new character in general, you know, whether it's this or any of the other projects you've been on, what are some of the things as an actor you do? Do you do a lot of research? Do you journal? Like, what's sort of your approach to building someone? A lot of it is the, in the, in the words, and it's in the script for me. It's, the script becomes the Bible, pun intended, um, <laughs> and really, focusing on what is uh, 
as much in the lines as in between the lines. And the, 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 the greatest thing about this show is that there's so much subtext here. It's dripping in subtext. And that was the, also the biggest draw cut. When I first read the script, my agent, who's here tonight, and my managers, um, said, you, ha you have to read this. This is, this is amazing. And I remember reading it going, fuck, wow, this is, this is so great. It's not often that you come across something that's so powerful that's dripping in subtext. And I think that that's the ultimate thing, is to be able to do stuff without words. That's, um, that's one of my favorite things. I feel like I'm not answering your question. No, you did. It's OK. OK. But, you know, <laughs> and when, but in talking about the subtext, there's a great moment. I think it's actually in episode six, which is the Serena flashback moment, where she's talking to Offred. And you know, she says something to the effect of like, uh, the, she's wearing the thing. And Offred says, well, red's my color. Mm -hmm. red, red looks good. I mean, Serena goes, well, you're very lucky then. And, there's so much interesting interplay between those two women in this show, both on the surface and beneath the surface. I mean, there's almost a sense of Serena wanting Offred to be her friend in some ways. Yeah, I'm so glad you saw that. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are those weird moments, and that, but that's also a credit to Lizzie working with Elizabeth Moss and having that chemistry come alive in between action and cut is playing with all those moments and also um, a, a credit to them for casting a younger Serena Joy because you, I don't think that power play would have been as evident and present if Serena Joy had been cast in honor of the book. You know, with a younger Serena Joy who is the same age as Alfred, the idea of being infertile is so raw and present in the forefront of her mind that it immediately brings up all the jealousy, all the envy, the competition, the, all the fucked up things that those two are going through, it, it, it's, it's even riper than it would have been, yeah. I mean, in talking about the chemistry, I mean, w during the audition process, did you have any chemistry tests with Joseph or with anyone else? It was sort of just a, we'll meet on set on day one yeah. kind of thing. I mean, yeah. what, did, what did the two of you do? Because, you know, we don't realize, obviously it's in the book, but the audience doesn't know, if you haven't read the book, sort of this backstory that the commander and Serena have and sort of where they came from and who they were before this community was built. What did the two of you talk about in terms of building your own couple backstory? Uh, we talked about where, how they might have met, you know, and the thing that sort of made sense was that their parents, you know, kind of set them up through church or something like that. And um, we had a lot, we talked a lot. Joe and I had a lot of discussions actually about what the dynamic was. And I think we did that also, I mean, at least for me, I remember when I read episode six and I was blown away by um, what a departure it was from what we had spent so much time investing in, which was this current, present, Gilead world where you meet the very sad and bitter Serena Joy and all these people and suddenly we have to launch back into where it all began where it was you know happy and brighter and uh, it, it just felt like a whole completely different project suddenly so there was a lot of conversation regarding especially that episode about how do they used to have sex like how did you know, that, that scene where they're praying and they're about to make love. How does, what does that feel like? And, you know, what did they used to do? Uh, it just felt very, um, almost unnatural, you know, from what, you know, she is now. I know, it was strange. Like the scene when they go to the movies and she's holding like a large tub of popcorn. I'm like, that doesn't feel right. Like it was just, it was like too contemporary in a way, which I thought worked so well because you're living in this world of The Handmaid's Tale where everything is so dystopian in a lot of ways and to actually think, oh, this is post our society is so chilling in so many ways. I mean, when you, you keep talking about Serena being a bitch, which, fair, you know. <laughs> but you can't approach her that way. You know, as the person playing her, you have to really ground and root every decision in authenticity and in the emotionality of it. So, I mean, for you, what has been so important about making some of these bitchy things extremely grounded for you? The most important thing was making sense of every single little thing, which kept me um, entertained for the whole six months while we filmed this, because it, um, so, sometimes it was hard. You know, I'm spending a lot of time justifying someone's actions who 
I don't like and I don't agree with. So, um, you know, and, and a lot of it just came from uh, building, building it from that one thought of she's obviously incredibly hurt and there's no trust between her and the commander and uh, dishing that out, dishing, like having t her taking it out on Offred. And the idea also that Serena, I mean, every, every character in this story is having a survival journey. It, we see it through the eyes of Offred, but you know, you look at every single one of the characters and they're all trying to survive in their own right. And Serena has this weird negotiation with her own survival because she was part of creating the world. And now she's in it and it sucks for her too. So it it's, a, it's a constant negotiation, I think, of feelings that she probably doesn't want to be feeling and doesn't want to acknowledge, but, she ha but she's feeling them because she's human. And, um, and, 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 and the loss of her own rights. You know, she, she was a celebrated author, you know, a, a spokeswoman for um, f domestic feminism, as she called it. Uh, <laughs> Whatever that means, um, <laughs> and, um, and and the idea that she doesn't get to do that anymore. I think you know you look. You are, I mean that was one thing that really stuck out to me was, you know, what, what would you do if you couldn't do your job, your favorite thing, you couldn't touch the person that you loved anymore? That's debilitating. It's so uh, it's so oppressive, and you add all the rest of it into it. I just, that I mean that to me is the core of. Serena yeah. is all of that. Yeah, there's that great moment in episode six at the party. You know, we've spent the whole episode learning where she came from and the people who come and visit are talking about the book and her past life. And I think it's bringing that to the surface for her in a way it hadn't been for a long time. And so at the party, when she stands up and starts to speak, it's felt like such an act of just like brazen, like I'm here and I am a part of this. And it was a, I thought it was a really, almost triumphant moment for her in a lot of ways to take the ownership of that, to say we have created this and we did all of that. I mean, that had to be a pretty incredible episode to sort of really start to pick apart and get into. It was, it was pr the hardest one for sure, because it, um, there, was that, there was that bold move and there was all the past stuff and the things we had to go into that we hadn't touched on before and um, yeah, I remember that one was definitely the most challenging. More challenging than the moment we saw in the finale when she decides to take Offred to see her child? Yeah, <laughs> but but that was horrible too. It, it, yeah, it's, but, it's not fun to <laughs> be the, the, the brutal person and have another person in front of you breaking down. It's not... It's well, not fun. What was so interesting about that moment, though, and it comes back to something we were talking about before, it felt like Serena did that in so many ways because her friend in her mind had violated their friendship. You know, she had done these things yeah. with the commander, and I liked that it wasn't just a, you're my handmaid, but it's like, if you're going to be my friend, you need to behave appropriately, too. Otherwise, I can punish you then as well. Yeah, and I think that you've totally touched on something that struck me too, was that it, it was, I think, A, this is the most devastating news to her. It's like the one thing that Serena is still holding on to is this idea of having a baby. That That's her solution to her shitty life, you know? And and not only has is that now gone, but this person has chosen to tell her the day after she found out. So she dragged it on for the evening and the whole night and waited until I invited her in somewhere. I think that added to it. And I always, I held on to this image also, um, had a vision of Serena as this uh, boiling pot of water on a stove. I used to, I don't, I don't know where it came from. I think I just, I just thought of it, but you know, back then, not right now, <laughs> just to be clear. Um, <laughs> And I, I, I just imagine the lid being so tightly on the, the pot of the boiling water and every so often that pot would, the lid would have to lift to let out the immense steam that was boiling up inside of her because just like everyone, every character in Gilead, you don't have an outlet. And when things get really real and you need an outlet, then I think for Serena, it's 
going to be offered, no matter what, because she that, that's her punching bag. Yeah. One of the things that really struck me, Yvonne, when I was watching the show was it seemed like you were paying a lot of attention to Serena's physicality. There's a very, I find, specific way she carries herself. She's very upright and rigid and constantly sort of seems positioned in some way. I mean, is, am I just reading into it too much or were there thoughts about sort of how she moves in this world and the status she's in? No, I mean, I wanted it to be a little statusy and a bit hoity-toity, you know, like a, just a little bit like yeah. that. So, um, yeah. How, I mean, how, how much when you sort of have to jump into a situation like this, because you've done so much episodic television at this point, you know, you've done shows that have run for many seasons and you've done shows that have been shorter runs. What do you like about the open-endedness of being and building a character where you don't know their destination? That used to really bother me. Because <laughs> um, you, don't, you don't know really what is going to happen. And you really only know as much as you try to seek and as much as people are willing to tell you, you know. So I always find the writers are the best people to talk to because they will always hope, usually try and, you know, give you more. And that a lot of the times people don't want to tell you stuff, you know. You're on a show and and they want to keep it a secret and a surprise for the cast just as much as they want to for the audiences. So that can get a bit confusing when it's like that. But it, I mean, a lot of it is um, instinctual and, um, and, but, but just in investing in what you think is going to be the road that you follow. Because I often find that they, they follow you too, you know, you're, you're up there doing your thing and they, they notice what they know what you're doing and they can see where you're going with it too. So there's a, there's a little bit of that I find. And I'm sure the book must have been an invaluable resource once you got into it and sort of feeling out maybe sort of deepening who she was and things like that. Yeah, the book was definitely uh, a, a very valuable resource. I read it in two, it was like two days, I think. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it, I mean, it was also like a Bible, but more so I think Lizzie um, gained a lot from it because it was basically like her diary, you know what I mean? So... For me, it was definitely uh, a springboard into, uh, you know, the rest of it, which was then the next layer of how do we add feelings and humanize this woman a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Well, speaking of humanization, uh, Carmen was wondering which, wh which character you feel the most empathy for on the show. Ah. <sighs> Uh, oh God, Alexis Bledel's character in the, oh my God, I can't actually watch that, um, that third episode. I've seen it a lot actually, but it kills me every time they're driving away in the van together and oh, it's just devastating, it's devastating and so brutal. It's, yeah. <laughs> Um, well, it actually leads into an interesting question that came from Debbie Waters, who is somewhere right there. Hi. Hello. I mean, you know, all of the characters, all of the women characters, I'll say, are in constant emotional distress because of what is happening to them in a lot of ways. And so there's so much emotion that is on the screen at all times. I mean, how do you, what is sort of like your preparation if you know you have a very big emotional scene coming up? Uh, the no number one thing for me is the um, investing in the character prior. It's it's not even on the day. It's all the um, it's just all the stuff that you've put into it in in the lead up and all the little details and all the little intricate things that you've thought of. I think are what really serves me in in a moment like that where I have to do an emotional scene and you're doing it over and over and over again, like the nursery scene. Um, it's it's all the investing work that you've done prior to that, really, that is the, the number one thing for me. Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm curious because the show has put everyone in an interesting position because you had the book and the scripts to lean on in season one. and the whole of season one covers the book, right? I mean, the pretty much anything that comes from here on out will be some sort of invention, 
in some ways. N no, apparently. No. I mean, there's, there's the, well, there's uh, going to be some stuff still from the book. Okay, so they're, right, so they're pulling, they're pulling things out inspiration, here and there. Right. Yes, yes. But I mean, it, it is a slightly more freeform thing going into season two. I mean, does that excite you to sort of know that you get to take this world that Margaret Atwood set out and just continue to blow it out and make it bigger? It does. I think, you know, what's so exciting about the, this world is that the rules are so rigid. And so any little thing that is outside of the box that is Gilead is going to be dangerous and exciting in some way. And I, and what's most exciting is, um, I think for, for me, for Serena, is what when her... Um, her own moral, very rigid moral compass is challenged against her will, and I, and I, how that starts to fall apart, and if it falls apart, will it ever fall apart completely? That she starts a revolution? Probably not. I don't know. <laughs> Season ten, maybe. Um, but it's 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 all the it's the unraveling, which is so great to watch on a show like this. Yeah, I loved that her final moment on the season this year is, you know, this sort of face to face with Alfred where she says to her, after everything we've done for you. <laughs> it was just like, I love shameful. I, <laughs> I love that even in her last moment this year, she's like, look at all this great stuff you have. <laughs> you have a red dress that looks good on you. You got 10 of them. You got, <laughs> you got a bonnet. I mean, but. But I mean, does that really speak to, in your mind, the commitment she has to that this is the right thing? I mean, what they're doing is what's good for the community is not always good for the self in some ways. I mean, yeah, she's, uh, she's still a believer in a lot of the ways that, uh, you know, Gilead is running. So, yeah. Do you, I mean, from your perspective, do you think she holds pride in the cre help like helping create this or does she feel like she created a monster I feel like she knows unconsciously that she created a monster I believe that she's in a place where she isn't willing or ready or able to um, acknowledge the damage that's been done, truly acknowledge the damage. I think she's still in survival mode. And I think that's because she hasn't had everything taken away from her yet. There's not, you know, she's, she still has stuff to hold on to. And if she ever does lose everything, then maybe it'll change. But she's still at the top of the food chain here. And it's that, it's that weird thing of, um, D denial and uh, you know humans are really great at denying stuff you know so and she's really good at that I think <laughs> well I mean over the course of the first season I mean what what have you enjoyed about getting to go on this journey in playing her I've enjoyed the fact that I get to do something I've never done before I enjoy the fact that um, this isn't something that anybody I don't think anyone looked at me and said, oh, you should be on the list for actresses to play Serena Joy. And that is exciting for me. That's awesome that I am playing Serena Joy because <laughs> uh, I never got to do anything like this and, um, and I've always wanted to do something like this. So that to me is the most exciting thing. And pl like any job, I mean, any job gives me so much joy to go experience in a new city usually we're filming anywhere but LA of course where we live and um, me meeting people and learning from other people and seeing everybody's different uh, ways how, how they are on set what they're doing with the material and um, it's just all a big fat learning thing that will never stop for as long as I'm doing it you know hopefully that's a long time Right. The um, the fan reaction to this show has been like massive. I mean, people are obsessed with it. I told you like my entire office can't every Wednesday. It's like, oh, it's Dan Maid's Tale Day. Um, <laughs> I mean, have you started to notice? You know, because you were on a show that had a very, very, very rabid fan base and still does to this day in a lot of ways. Have you noticed uh, like a wavering in the amount of people coming up to you now and being like, Serena Joy is the worst. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> 
like, just like the, it's like it's more Handmaid's Tale now, like that people are getting into it. You know, it's still Chuck. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, but I've had a couple of uh, Serena Joy moments. I think I've only had two. It's not been that much. They're getting there. So for every, like, it's going to build. Yeah. It's going to build. I mean, but, you know, that really was, for so many people, sort of their first expo in, in America, you know, through Chuck, was like the big first getting to meet you. Um, had you grown up always wanting to be an actor? Yeah. From, like, how, how, how always? I, I was... Uh, I took my first acting class when I was 12-ish, and uh, I was the, I was the um, the really lanky, skinny, acne-covered, goofy, um, buck-toothed girl who just really liked to uh, steal my dad's big JVC camera, you know those big ones that you used to have to put on your shoulder. And um, just make make some home videos. Pretend uh, just make some documentaries, some fake commercials, anything. So I mean, at at a young age, what do you think it was that you loved about acting? No, I think I was just a big show off when I was a kid, <laughs> and um, I just liked it. I don't know. I really just loved it, and then I. I ended up doing drama at school. I did anything I could get my hands on. I my, my, my friend here from high school, who we were in the drama ensemble after school, and um, been around each other for like 20 years. Um, there she is, she's all the way at the back. <laughs> um, and it, I don't know, we, we did all the school plays, we did all the school Shakespeare's, all the musicals, all the, anything, you know, anything I could get my hands on. I was also, I, I loved dancing too, I was always, um, thought I would be more maybe in the dancing world, but just, it was just like one thing after another. I just kept going with it. When you were in school, I mean, you studied in Australia, I'm assuming? Yes. I'm just guessing. <laughs> um, I mean, what kind of styles did you study in? Did you study in different sort of techniques, or what was the approach to acting like in your school? We had an amazing, you mean school school, high school, or no, any I mean school? when you professional sort of acting Oh, oh university. Oh, it's okay, right. So we went, I went to university, also have some friends here from my theater school. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, did it, we did a whole bunch of stuff. We did Stanislavski, we did Meisner, we did, um, I don't know, fuck, what else, tell me. I can't remember. We did a, a lot. Shakespeare, we, we ran around hugging the furniture going, ah, you know. <laughs> you know, you do all those drama exercises and, bah, and like, release, you know. Yeah. We did all, <laughs> all of it. <laughs> what, what were the ones that as an actor you responded to the most in terms of your own process? I, res I remember responding to Stanislavski, but we did, we did Stanislavski in high school. I remember having an incredible... We had an incredible, incredible drama department, and we learned. I remember all that stuff about emotional memory recall. That really, um, that stuck with me, and just the simplicity of what if, you know, what if, uh, what if you really were in that position? What if? I just think that two simple words really um, make you put you in that position, and really, you know ask you to deliver the truth of the the feeling of every moment you know what if what if i really was here yeah that what if must have been so fun on handmaid's tale <laughs> <laughs> just what if Ugh. um so after all the studying i had read that you actually auditioned via tape for chuck is that right well i mean how did that sort of process even come to happen that you ended up on tape for that um i that was 10 years ago. Um, I had, I was living in Australia and I had an Australian agent who I still, and I still have my Australian agent and she uh, was heading to the States and she said, you know, I'll take your headshot and I'm having some meetings. So, you know, and then I ended up going to the States and taking some meetings with people and I met my lovely managers who are also here tonight. <laughs> And um, and then 
then I went back to Australia because I had uh, I was finishing off uh, a guest star on on some TV show, and um, my managers were sending me a whole bunch of pilots for that year, and Chuck was one of them. And I had I, I mean I, I I didn't have I didn't know what I was doing. I I I didn't I wasn't familiar with American scripts. I'd never seen an American script before. It was, it was really the first time, and I remember renting out a studio in um, in Sydney to put down a bunch of these auditions, Chuck was one of them, um, and then the tape got sent off and then we didn't hear back for a while and then I jumped on a plane, had a return ticket to come here because I was gonna just come and meet casting agents and, and whatever and then go back home. And I, Patrick Rush, the casting agent, called on the day that I arrived, uh, my managers, and said, you know, we, we just saw the tape, we'd like to meet Yvonne, and I remember going in and, meeting the creators of the show, Josh Watts and Chris Fiedek and McGee who directed it and they were intense and uh, then they kept talking about going in the next day to test, test. And I kept thinking, what is this test? What is this? And I, I had, had no idea. But then I went in and I tested for Warner Brothers um, and then for NBC, the studio the day after and um, and then they, they came out and they said, congratulations, you got the job and that was it. And um, I remember being gobsmacked and calling my, I pulled out of Bob Hope Drive, out of that gate right there, and <laughs> pulled over in my rental car and called mom and dad in Australia, and I said, I don't, I don't know if I'm coming home when I, <laughs> when I thought it was going to come home. Um, so I, I, got, I got thrown, I got really lucky, and it was an amazing opportunity that came my way, and... Um, Boy, was I thrown in the deep end yeah. as a freshie. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I would imagine that that has to be an incredibly intense experience to basically go from, uh, you know, living at home to being here and being sort of, I guess, number two on a show that is on NBC, you know, at its height. I mean, wh how do you sort of, how did you get through that time? Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know it was it was hard. You you don't. Um, I'm so lucky right now. I have so many people that I've been shouting out to all night. That my my friends are now here. A lot of my besties from Australia now live here too. But I didn't have that when I first was here, and I was experiencing all these amazing highs, while at the same time experiencing the lowest of lows because I didn't have any. I didn't know anyone. Um, uh, so you know you. It's this weird thing of you're negotiating one of the best experience in your, experiences in your life as a, as a female lead on a network television show. And at the same time, you're not quite sure what is going on. So you're going through eight different rental cars from that shitty car rental place down on La Cienega somewhere. <laughs> um, and living in <laughs> shoebox apartments, you know, one to the other. I, I didn't, I just didn't, I just kept thinking it was going to end. So I was moving from one place to another to another and living out of this one suitcase. Um, and then, you know, when my that plane ticket expired, I realized, oh, I should probably, I should probably live here <laughs> and keep going. So then I went on Craigslist and found a roommate and <laughs> moved to Laurel Canyon. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm curious, <laughs> so many questions, um, but I am curious, you know, because coming into a 22 or a 24, whatever it was at that time, episode season, I mean, the endurance it must take to make it through that, especially a show that was so physical where you were in so much, I mean, you must have had to really learn about like pacing and what it takes to have the tenacity endurance to get through an entire season of making television. Yeah, and it's funny because I wish someone, maybe someone did say it, and I probably didn't know what they were talking I about. Wish you but listened to them when they said When they said, you are not going to have a life anymore. And it's true. You're, we worked, um, we worked 18 hour days every day on that show. Uh, especially in the first season, it went down a little bit, and by the end, we were maybe fifteen hour days. But um, you you're working your ass off on something like that, and especially you know, I was doing a fight scene, 
pretty much every episode or one or two or something. So um, it was ex- it was exhausting. That was um, that's that's a lot. It's a lot, you know. It's <laughs> To, it's a lot of sleep deprivation, but at the same time, you're having this amazing experience, and you're you're doing something that so many people want to do, and um, and you're so grateful. It's a it's a weird balance. Yeah. I mean, and I remember they also, uh, you know, you were talking before about writers getting to start to write for the actor. They also started to write in some of your strengths, some of the foreign languages you spoke, and sort of this amazing ability you have to accent your way through situations. I mean, it must have been cool to be in a situation where the writers were so attuned to your own personal skill sets and have that worked into the role. Yeah, I mean, that was that was amazing. I, I love that role. I mean, I got to I got to do action, comedy, drama. I, I mean, we it was it was so much fun and um, such a great way to to learn. You know, I learned I learned so much um about american production about how television works here i learned so much about american comedy you know um watching watching all my active friends you know do their thing uh on the show it's um which is also an an important thing was an important thing for me to observe because you know as australians we grow up and we're pretty saturated with american tv over there and we we watch all the sitcoms and stuff growing up but um but it's a whole other thing to really watch people skillfully do it you know and um and that was one of the biggest joys of working on that show was watching everybody be really funny when that show came to an end, you know, you were saying it afforded you the opportunity to do comedy, to do drama. I mean, when it came to an end, what were you looking for in a next role? You know, did, was there something you felt like the show didn't tap into that you wanted to do more of? Um, I, I was worried that um, that I would forever be seen as a CIA agent in in the community here. You think you thought Hollywood would typecast you? <laughs> what are you crazy? No. But I mean th- but that's a I think that's a real thing that everyone deals with no matter what you're what you look like you're always pigeonholed for that. And every single person deals with that in their own way. And um you know, it's it's easy for me to get the CIA job. It's easy for me to you know, call up Josh Schwartz and be like, let's make a TV show about a cop running around, you know, shooting guns and whatever. Because they've already seen me do that. And, um, but that's not, that's not what I want to do. I want to keep doing different things. That's my joy and my job. And what I, what I love is that I, I get to explore these different people and different characters and different worlds through my job. So, um, you're you're always trying to break out of a pattern, um, and I feel like everybody's faced with that. I think no matter what level you're on, you're always faced with a version of that. Um, so that that's why this show has has been so important for me, you know. And and other things that I've gotten to done, like the you know being part of Dexter for the last two seasons, and that was very different too. And yeah. thanks. <laughs> Um, you know, so it's it's yeah. it's great, but I think everyone's trying to fight that fight For sure. to some extent. Yeah, and I thought, like you're saying, Dexter was an awesome opportunity because it was such a after playing someone who wasn't so superhuman in so many ways, it was such a human role, and it was such a you know grounded person. I mean, what did you enjoy about getting to play Hannah on Dexter for those two years? Oh, I love that she she wasn't she wasn't a good guy. She was manipulative and um, you know controlling and just a whole five, ten, twenty shades darker than someone like Sarah Walker. You know, um, so that that was really fun. And working with Michael C. Hall was amazing. Also, another amazing person to watch work. I'm curious because, you know, one of the things that everyone who deals with the fear 
of typecasting or being put into the same box that they have to endure are the sort of the auditions that then play into that mentality when you get all the scripts that are the CIA agent or what have you. I mean, for you, do you enjoy the audition process? I uh, I do. I'm I I don't know what it is. I think I like the I like the pressure. I like um I like the newness of it. Um I like trying to convince people to hire me for something. I don't know. I like <laughs> there's I don't know, there's something about it. But I also train we we had a very um extensive training uh theater training program. In fact, our 3 year drama degree was basically theater. We, we might have done four weeks of camera work and that was it. So I didn't really, I didn't learn camera stuff really until I was on a job. Um, so maybe that, um, that sort of in the moment pressure thing comes from having done stage work all in my, um, in my teens and early adulthood, perhaps. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the idea I, that talking about the newness of the auditioning is kind of cool because like I've interviewed a bunch of people up here and they always talk about how what you do in an audition room is mostly just to give the casting directors confidence that you can do it on the day. Um, I mean, what, do, what have you found about auditioning and sort of really getting to make a meal out of those moments that you enjoy? What have I found? Well, I mean, when you're talking about like liking the newness of it, is it just the opportunity to try someone new all the time? Yeah, I've sort of, um, you know, I get nervous, I get stressed out and all the rest of it, but um, I try to look at it as uh, an opportunity to exercise in a weird way and an opportunity to, you know, you, you get, I get nervous and stressed and whatever when I think about you know, the, who's going to be in the room or who's watching and, you know, if I'm going to remember this or remember that and blah, blah, blah. But if I just pull it right back to um, this is for me, this is my moment, this is how I'm going to do this and I don't care <laughs> uh, what you'll think, <laughs> even though I really do, uh, <laughs> then that, that makes it better. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, when you have something, whether it's Chuck or Dexter or, you know, Handmaid's Tale, where there is so much intensity involved in the role, do you find it difficult to let go of at the end of a season? Uh, sometimes. Um, it depends on... Um like I, Serena was probably the most difficult out of anything ever to let go of. Um, maybe because she's the most unrelatable. And um, but then there are th there are times like uh, when I did um, I did a Broadway play two or three years ago now called Golden Boy, and I played a character called Lorna Moon, and she was also she was very uh, an intense character. And after eighty five shows, I was ready to go. <laughs> Away. I was done. Thank you very much. It was nice knowing you. Um, <laughs> so it it just depends. Yeah. Timeline wise, the show fell in between what seasons? The one you were just talking about. The the play. Yeah. Um, the play I did in between the two Dexter seasons, I believe. Yes. There we go. <laughs> well, the, re the reason I ask is because it had to have been such an interesting acting challenge to go from playing a linear journey to playing sort of like a cyclical one for so, so long. I mean, what did you like about returning to the stage and getting to really sit with someone and make like small changes throughout the run of a show? Oh, I mean, that was... Um that was the ultimate challenge, I think, after seven years of not, of not doing theater and um, not really knowing if I could ride that bike still. Um, so it was, I mean, it was just such a big fat challenge all around, you know, it's, um, it's really a, a challenge of pressure as well. You know, you're, you're out in front of 1,100 people doing a you know, Broadway debut with people who do this every day their whole life and I mean, that's, that's scary. So um, it was the challenge of that along with the character and all the good stuff that always comes with any new job and any new character. 
um, that was really part of it, yeah. Well, I mean, you have this opportunity now where you're going to get to return to Serena uh, and sort of see what the next chapter in her life is. I mean, what excites you about eventually stepping back into her, you know, green dress? Uh, I'm excited to just push her a little bit further. You know, I, I watched all of the episodes and, um, you know, I, I've... I have certain ideas about what I think, what I personally enjoyed watching in it and, and what I didn't and what I thought really worked versus what I thought was mediocre in my mind and just f f um, making that a little more, f um, f finessing that a little bit more and um, just sort of pushing her extremes, I think a little more also. So you can actually watch yourself and it's okay? I find it really productive. I know a lot of people do not enjoy it. I I don't know why, but I find it really, really productive. I can watch it. I like to see what I, th what I think I, I, I'm, I would have enjoyed watching differently. I'd like to, I don't know, I just, I really learn from it. Well, lastly, Vaughn, let me ask you this. I mean, you know, you've talked a little bit about the lessons perhaps you wish you would listen to someone tell you when you came. <laughs> I mean, for you, I mean, you have a room full of actors. I mean, obviously there's a litany of, you know, advice you could pass along, but I mean, is there something you wish you knew at the outset of your career that you would share? No pressure. <laughs> I think the biggest thing is to stay true to who you are and know exactly who you are as a person and what you personally want to achieve in your craft and what it brings for you. Because at the end of the day, there's gonna be so many people telling you you're awesome and then you're gonna read stuff where that's not so awesome or you're gonna get shitty feedback or you're gonna get great feedback. And none of it really matters and you really, I think have to be in it for you. That is the number one most important thing. You've got to be in it for you and just remind yourself every time you're on that audition and, and take that space and make it make it yours because at the end of the day, they're only gonna hire you because you're because they want you to do it your way. So it really does um, it really does have to be about you and your heart and what what you wanna do. Well, congratulations on everything you got to do in the first Thank season you. of this. It's so incredible. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thanks. Thank you to all of you. Thanks, everybody.